The Shedden Massacre is one of the most gruesome biker wars in history. This massacre resulted in the murder of eight members of the Bandidos Motorcycle Club by other members of the club in a barn outside of London, Ontario. It is a mystery that is both fascinating and difficult. Even well-versed members of the outlaw motorcycle subculture had no idea how the events occurred. The police, relatives of the family, and even members of opposing gangs can only shake their heads. But what really happened in the Shedden Massacre? Wayne Kellestein, a man who had previously served as president of the Bandidos chapter in Toronto, was the mastermind behind the killings. Kellestein had become persuaded that the only way he could grab control of the U.S.-based biker gang's Canadian business and a profitable trade in methamphetamine was by eliminating the majority of his fellow Toronto members and then laying the killings on their adversaries, the Hell's Angels. The Toronto Bandidos were known for their intimidating bravado, yet they had little money and power in the criminal underworld. They held what they liked to term church meetings in the basement of a now-defunct Greek restaurant near the corner of Queen Street East and Broadview Avenue because the self-styled No Surrender crew had no clubhouse of their own. However, on the evening of April 7, 2006, they were contacted and asked to attend a gathering on Kellestine's property, which is located just to the west of London. As they were led inside the barn at approximately 10.30 p.m., the men made light-hearted banter and idle conversation. Michael Sandom, a fellow club member, came armed with a weapon in military style. Brett Gardner was listening to police radio scanners, and outside in the darkness, circling the barn with rifles and shotguns, were Dwight Mushy, the proprietor of a nightclub in Winnipeg, Marcelo Aravena, an unsuccessful mixed martial arts fighter, Frank Mather, a homeless guy with an extensive criminal record but no history of violent crime, and a biker from Winnipeg who was only ever named as M.H. M.H. would subsequently avoid prosecution by becoming the star witness during the trial of his fellow bikers. He provided a terrifying narrative of what took place at the barn. The only member of the group who was supposed to be ambushed and had a weapon was Raposo, and when he realized they were being ambushed, he fired his sawed-off shotgun, striking Sandom in the chest. However, Sandom was wearing a bulletproof vest he had been given when he worked as a police officer in a rural area of Manitoba. As a result, the pellets were deflected away from him. Sandom then returned fire and killed Raposo. The rest ran for the barn door, but Kellestine was waiting for them and opened fire with his pistol as soon as they arrived. George Jessom, John Muscadere, Frank Salerno, Paul Sinopoli, Jamie Flans, Michael Trotta, and Luis Manny Raposo were all murdered in the gruesome shooting. After that, Kellestine gave the order for the deceased to be loaded into their automobiles. Because no one was willing to drive Muscadere's automobile while it still had his body in the driver's seat and the entire front row of seats was covered in blood, Jessom's tow truck was used to haul the vehicle away. The overweight body of Sinopoli did not have enough room in the SUV trunk in which it was stored along with the other corpses, and it came dangerously close to rolling out of the vehicle on multiple occasions while traveling up Highway 401. Kellestine intended to drive the victims along Highway 401 to the Hells Angels stronghold in Kitchener, where he expected the authorities to pin the murders on the motorcycle gang. However, he did not buy enough gas for the trip, which forced the killers to abort the trip to Kitchener. The killers dumped the bodies in a farmer's field chosen at random only because they could not go any further up the 401. Kellestine, who remained at his farm the entire time, was taken aback when the farm workers returned after around half an hour since he had instructed them to transport the bodies all the way to Kitchener. On the morning of April 8, 2006, a farmer named Russell Steele and his wife Mary received a phone call from a different farmer named Forbes Oldham, who informed them that there were automobiles parked in their cornfield. The Steeles went to examine the situation, and upon discovering the bodies, they immediately alerted the authorities. Because the victims were last seen alive approaching Kellestine's farm, and their bodies were discovered adjacent to his farm, he was immediately believed to be a key suspect in the case. On the same day that the bodies were discovered, the investigator in charge of the case, Detective Inspector Paul Beasley of the Ontario Provincial Police, 
sought a judge for permission to investigate the farm owned by Kellestine. In the afternoon, two of Kellestine's pals, Carrie Morris and Eric Neeson, showed up at his farm to assist him in getting rid of the evidence and to talk about the alibi they intended to provide for him. Neeson and Morris's alibi was that they had spent the night of April 7th drinking beer with Kellestine at his farmhouse, and it was the only thing that had occurred there during that night at the farmhouse. However, the law enforcement officers watched as Morris and Neeson assisted Kellestine in cleaning out his barn while they were stationed in automobiles along the Aberdeen line. A comprehensive forensic investigation was initiated on the Kellestine farm, and by the month of May, the authorities discovered the charred keys to the homes and apartments of the Shedden 8 murder victims, as well as a business card that read Onico, the name of Flans's computer company that had been partially burned in the fireplace. Under Kellestine's microwave, Constable Al Dubrow also uncovered a hidden Kellestine's hidden gun cache. There were a total of 18 firearms in Kellestine's gun stash. Ballistic tests revealed that some of the firearms discovered in Kellestine's arsenal were in fact those used in the murders. On one of the handguns, microscopic traces of blood were discovered, which DNA testing revealed came from Flans, Criaracus, Sinopoli, Jasome, and Salerno. The discovery of the bodies sparked a frenzy in the media, and immediately, the media pointed the finger of guilt at the Hells Angels. It was reported on the front pages of newspapers all over the world, including the Times of London, the Sydney Morning Herald of Sydney, the Irish Examiner of Cork, and the People's Daily of Beijing. Additionally, both CNN and Fox News dispatched news teams to Shedden to report on what the media began to refer to as the Shedden Massacre. The villagers of Shedden were very upset when they heard the word Shedden Massacre, as they asserted that their hamlet had nothing to do with the atrocity in question. Kellestine was later taken into custody and charged with first-degree murder. Neeson and Morris were also charged with first-degree murder because they provided an alibi for Kellestine by stating that they were at his farm on the night of the killings. This came as a complete surprise, as they had never imagined that lying to the police would have such severe repercussions. Along with Kellestine, Mather and Gardner were also taken into custody and charged with first-degree murder. M.H. had a meeting with Constable Timothy Dyack. During that meeting, Dyack informed M.H. that the police knew he was involved in the massacre and that he could turn in evidence or go to prison for the rest of his life. The following day, M.H. requested $750,000 and freedom from prosecution in exchange for testifying against the other individuals. Ultimately, it was decided that in exchange for M.H.'s agreement to wear a wire and give over information to the Crown, he would be granted complete immunity from prosecution, $1,300 per month for the rest of his life, and free rent. Working as an undercover agent, M.H. started conversing with Mushi and Aravina about the massacre while wearing a wire. He found it easy to get Mushi to start talking by telling him that Sandom was boasting about killing three of the eight men in underworld circles. This led Mushi to say that Sandom had killed only Raposo, and messed up the killing of Flans. Since Sandom had shortly disappeared after his return, the Winnipeg police began monitoring him. Constable Grant Goulet saw Sandom bringing his blazer to a car with half of the interior cleaned. Sandom was then seen getting the tires removed from his vehicle, after which he dumped his old tires on the side of a rural country road. An investigation indicated that the tire marks that were discovered on Kellestine's farm were a perfect match for the tires that Sandom had recently left behind in the countryside. He was then arrested and also charged with first-degree murder. Before we wrap up this gripping account of the Shedden Massacre, one of the most chilling biker wars in history, we want to extend a sincere invitation to you, our viewers. If you've been captivated by the twists and turns of this dark and mysterious tale, don't miss out on more intriguing content. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to stay in the loop. We're committed to bringing you stories that delve into the depths of human nature, shedding light on the untold stories that often defy explanation. But we're not done just yet. We're eager to hear your thoughts, theories, and insights on the Shedden Massacre. What do you think really happened in that barn outside of London, Ontario? 
Leave a comment below and let's engage in a thought-provoking discussion. Your active participation is what fuels our passion to continue uncovering the hidden layers of history's most puzzling mysteries. So, remember to subscribe, ring the bell, and share your thoughts. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the enigmatic stories that shape our world.